welcome to Edge Hill University today. So amazing to see, we've just said we didn't expect so many faces to be looking at us. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's the Game Changers event and we have got four incredible women. They're going to talk their stories about being in sports and being in sport media as well today. So you'll hopefully you'll take away some interesting facts and some advice as well. Uh, just so you know how the, the event's going to pan out, we're going to have uh, each of our amazing women are going to speak and then we're going to have a Q&A because I know a lot of you want to ask some questions. So we're going to fire as many questions at you all as physically possible. Uh, no pressure, it'd be like a game show. Um, and it, just so everyone knows as well, Simone McGill, Everton have kindly allowed her to come even though they have got training today. Uh, so she has got to leave at quarter past one a little bit early, but I don't want to get in trouble with Everton, so I've said that's absolutely fine. And uh, so she's not being rude, you're going to shoot off, aren't you? But we're going to get to you as quickly as we can. So our panel, in case you don't know here, we've got Sue Smith, we've got Zaina Balina, and we've got Simone McGill and Dawn Airy on the end there. And they're all going to tell you about their stories in sports. So uh, today's event as well is going on social media. So if you are taking photographs or you want to give us your thoughts uh, when you go home, positive, please. Um, <laughs> please put them on to Twitter. You can copy in at Edge Hill and hashtag it Game Changers as well. And we'll be looking out for as many of those tweets as well. So it'd be lovely to hear from you. Um, I think we're going to start now. So you get, you get the uh, honour of going first. For anyone who doesn't know, Sue has played for Tranmere, Lincoln Ladies, Doncaster Rovers, Bells. She made 93 appearances for England as well. A lot of you may know Sue from our TV screens. <laughs> you are on a lot. You're a double act with Stephen Warnock, quite I a am, lot. Yes. <laughs> you uh, and you're also a former student here. Yes. And you got an honorary uh, doctorate in 2009. I did. Uh, so you know the place very well. Yes. So if you want to start by telling us a bit about yourself. Yeah, I will do. Um, good afternoon, everyone, first of all. Um, thank you for, for inviting me. And it is actually great to be back because I studied here. I actually worked it out before, it was like 20 years ago. So it's changed so much, it's, it's developed, but lovely place and it's, it's really great to, to be back. So yeah, I'm gonna start from, from the very beginning really of, of my, my journey, uh, because it's very different to what a journey of a, a female footballer would be like now. Um, I started to play football when I was about five years old uh, for a local boys team, because there wasn't any girls teams around when I was little. So if I wanted to play football, that's what I had to do, which is, so different to now there's so many girls teams if i go back to my my local area which is is rain hill it's only a small village there's like three or four teams that, that girls can join um, and i was that annoying little sister that used to follow my brother everywhere so my brother used to go to training every saturday morning Radle united and i used to follow him going can i play can i play <laughs> and eventually they said oh yeah just let her play so i played with the the local boys team um, and i loved it and i was the one that was there all the time, you know, hail, rain or snow, I'd turn up to training. Like my brother was still in bed, but I kept going because I just really, really enjoyed playing. Uh, then at the age of 12, um, the FA stopped me playing mixed football. So I had to sign for a ladies team. The nearest team to me was, was Tranmere Rovers, but that was still about 35 minutes away from my house. So thankfully my dad could drive. So um, my dad used to take me to training twice a week pay for the, the subs and the, the toll and, and things like that. So without the support of him and, and my family, probably wouldn't have been able to continue my, my football journey. Um, a lot of girls my age either went into a different sport or just packed in all together. So I was lucky that I, I had that support. So where it's quite different is I played for, for Tranmere senior women at 15. Um, I got selected for England senior women at 16. And I made my debut for England women's senior at 17, which is so different to now because I'd have been playing in, a, in an academy. So all of the WSL sides have an academy. Um, I'd have been playing for one of the England development teams. So it would have been the 15s, 17s, 19s. And I would have progressed through. So it wouldn't have been so much of a big jump. It wouldn't have been, you know, a, a kid literally going to play women's football. And I think when you look at the, you know, the sort of academies now, it's amazing, you know, that the structure that they have and, and like I say, that the progression just makes it that, that little bit easier because I remember going to Tranmere and, and our training sessions consisted of, we'd, we'd do like a 30 minute fitness session and that would just be running around the house and state for 30 minutes. And then we'd go, <laughs> then we'd go and we'd just play 11 v 11. Um, so I remember first going to England and it was structured and there was coaching and I was like, wow, this is, this is so different. They were telling me what I needed to eat, what I needed to drink. Um, and that's what the girls get now from a, a very young age. They have that structured coaching session. They have the strength and conditioning. They have the nutrition, the sports psychology. Um, so they're, they're better prepared, I suppose, for that 
that transition all the way through. But I feel like I'm lucky that I've seen both sides of the game. So I've seen the completely amateur side where I had to pay to play. Um, I've seen the semi-professional side where I was paid a little bit, but I had to sort of work and, and study at the same time. And then I was also full-time professional when I was at Lincoln and, and at Doncaster Bells. Um, so when you look at the WSL sides now, they're all full-time professional. A lot of the championship teams are as well. So we are getting there. It, it's certainly progressing. OK, the next bit is the next part of my journey, just rushing through it, is, is the retirement um, side. And, and that's the bit as, as sports people we all hate. I absolutely hated it. And I never officially retired uh, because I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say that I've stopped playing. So I'm still, if Serena Wiegmann's around, um, I'm still available for that uh, 100th cap. <laughs> But um, that's where, you know, lots of athletes that I've spoke to and, and former players, they struggle with that transition because I think it's, they, I felt anyway, I lost my identity. I was always a footballer. And then suddenly I wasn't a footballer. And I was like, well, what am I? Um, but what I, I did do, I actively made sure that I did media throughout my football career because I thought, well, that's something that I'd quite like to get into after I finished playing. So I remember being at training sessions or after games and if, if media would come along I would be the first one to go yeah I'll do an interview whereas a lot of other players would maybe maybe swerve that side of it FA Cup final was always on BBC every year if I wasn't taking part or playing in it I would make sure that I'd be a pundit or a, a co-commentator on that and then I remember the Olympics um, I did my ACL just before the Olympics 2012 absolutely gutted as a player but made sure that I was I was a part of it in the the media side so coming towards the end of my career, I was thinking, yeah, what am I going to do? You know, is it time to start focusing on my media stuff? And I was getting opportunities that I was having to turn down because I was, I was still playing and training. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a year out and I'm going to see what my media is like and how it, how it progresses. And thankfully, it progressed really well. Um, and even though I missed football, I was getting a buzz out of, of doing this media. So I, I just continued really from that. And it's very similar to football, if you, if you think about it. You prepare all week, like you, you train all week. You have that sort of game at the weekend or you have that, that show at the weekend. So you're a bit nervous in the, in the build up to that. You perform, hopefully you do a good job, you have a good game and you, you feel good after yourself and you think, oh yeah, I did quite well there. Or you have a stinker and you're in a mood for the rest of the day or the, the rest of the week. But I don't know if there's any other profession that I would have probably felt like that or got those sort of emotions from. And as well, the other the thing that, that is very similar to football is how competitive it is. You know, you know as a footballer, if you don't perform, you know that you're going to get dropped. There's someone on the bench that's going to come in and, and take your place. Very similar in the media. You know, if you don't do a good job on, on your show, there's somebody just waiting around the corner to, to take your position. So I like that. I like that sort of pressure. And, and I feel that it drives me to, to be better. Um, and like I say, it really gives me a, a buzz. So I, I prepare really hard. I, I, I work a lot. Um, I watch football all of the time. It must be an absolute nightmare to live with. I think if you said to me what's happening in the, show, in the soaps or what's a, a good Netflix series, I wouldn't have a clue. Um, but if you say who's top of League One and who's potentially going to get relegated, I'd, I'd know. I'd be able to tell you. So I think, like I say, I, I love the media. So I love what I've gone into. But the only downside for me has been social media. Um, so that's something I'm just going to move on to now. And... We all know social media can be a, a really good place. Um, you know, it can be positive in terms of if you're promoting charities or I, I do a lot of my, my research from social media. Twitter gets everything first, doesn't it? Whenever you want to know anything, I always look on Twitter because it's always, it's always there. You can get positive feedback, um, which is always, always quite nice. But I might finish a show and, and have a little look through and I might get nine really nice comments. I get one horrible comment and that's the one that sticks. That's the one that, that you, you remember. It's strange, but, but it does. And I totally get that football's about opinions. You know, that's what we all love about football. I might say to you, I think Manchester City are going to win the Premier League this year. There might be some Liverpool fans in here going, <laughs> no, I think Liverpool are going to win the Premier League. And that's great. That sort of discussion is, is what we all, we all love about football. But it's when someone says, well, I don't agree with your opinion and it's because you're a woman. That's the thing that, that gets me. And I've spoke to other colleagues where they've said similar things, where they've had stuff that, you know, they don't agree with them because, they're, because of the gender, because of their sexuality, because of the colour of their skin. That's where it's out of order. That's where it's, it's wrong. And that's where it needs to, to change. So somebody actually, um, well, 
the, I suppose the worst experience that I had um, in the media was I do a football show with Steve Warnock on a Monday. And when I first started doing it, it was about four years ago. And in the media, you, you know that things can happen and change very drastically, quite quickly. So we were supposed to be doing a, a Premier League talk, and it was supposed to be doing talking about Arsenal. So I'd all prepped on Arsenal. Suddenly that wasn't happening, and we started to talk about Sheffield United, which I hadn't done a lot of prep for, um, because I didn't know that that was going to happen. So we started talking about Sheffield United, and, and I missed out that they had a, a striker called Billy Sharp, who's one of their own, who's you know very big striker in, in terms of that. Somebody clipped that little piece of me forgetting about Billy Shaw, put it on social media, put it on Twitter. I had a barrage of abuse. I mean, day after day. I remember driving home from London and my phone kept flashing. And I thought, well, you know, it's okay if someone's saying, oh, you've got that wrong, you forgot about Billy Sharp. I get that, that that's okay. But it was the name calling, it was the get back to the kitchen, which you don't think happens, it does still happen. Um, they were the th sort of things that got me and it made me question what I was doing. And I remember speaking to my family and friends and going, do you know what, I'm just gonna get a job where I don't have this sort of criticism and I, I won't get this sort of abuse if I, if I make a mistake. And thankfully I've got a good support network around me and they were sort of saying, get back, you need to get back in, you need to get back in quickly. But I was thinking, what do the other pundits think? What do the presenters think? Do they think I'm not very good? And I had a game a couple of days later and, and they pretty much forced me to go back in. And I'm so glad that they did. I did it, you know, did a good job, thankfully. And I, I got back and got through that, but, but that was difficult. And when I was in there, I remember speaking to one of the producers and they actually told me something really good that's helped me, that's helped me whenever I get sort of negative criticism. And that's like, why do you take criticism from people that you don't know? People that don't mean anything to you. You know, they're not your family. They're not your friends. They're not the producer or the director. They're just people behind the computer screen. Um, they've not walked in your shoes. They've not done the job that you do. They don't know how hard you work. So why are you taking that to heart? And that sort of took the sting out of it a little bit. So now if I ever read anything negative, I sort of think of that and, and it does help. So I know some of you might be sat there going, well, why do you stay on social media? Why don't you just go off it? Why don't you, why do you not, you know, don't read it, don't, don't look at it. But I think, why, why shouldn't I? You know, it, it's, there is positive things, there is good things, you know, it's good for research. So hopefully the media companies, the social media companies are doing their best to try and stop this because, you know, it's been a lot of high profile cases, as we know, that it is continuing to be a, a problem. Um, so, so yeah, that's pretty much it for me. So that's a little insight into sort of my journey and, and some of the obstacles that, that maybe I've faced throughout. It's brilliant, as you say, Sue, because you've maybe had a different journey to what Simone will tell us about as well, just because, yeah. of, you know, the, the age gap between you. Yeah. I just wanted to take you back then when you were playing as a child in boys' teams. Did you ever get comments? And I'm sure if any of the girls here, you know, have played football, did you ever get, this is a boys' game? Oh yeah, yeah, all the time. And because I was literally the only girl that, that played, so that was a, a regular occurrence. And I was known in my village as like, they didn't really know my name, they just knew I was the girl that played football because <laughs> there wasn't anybody else that, that played. And, and even in school, you know, there wasn't that many sort of girls that played football. So um, yeah, and I think that's been a, a, a continuous theme. You know, my, my parents would, would say to you that, often parents would go up to them and go, you okay with your daughter playing football? Is that okay? And they were like, yeah, she's fine. She loves it, you know, and, and they were very, <laughs> they, they used to take me to sort of dancing and gymnastics and things like that. And if anyone's seen me dancing, they know I'm not very good. So, um, and they just knew that football was my passion and was something that I really enjoyed. And I love all sports, you know, at school, I took part in every sport, but I would always go back to, to football. Um, so yeah, that's been a constant, sort of theme but I, th I think it's it's getting a lot better now I'm sure Simone will say you know yeah. that now I think it's because it's on the TV a lot more because there's so much more exposure to it it just seems that girls play football it's a, it's a natural thing yeah. girls play football boys play football it doesn't really matter and I said I've got a, a son and he plays football and it, he doesn't bat an eyelid if there's a girl in the team yeah. and that's really nice to see I think as well yeah. I think the next generation of boys they just see it as something that girls play football yeah. with us as opposed to you know whispering about it yeah. or calling names. Uh, you, you mentioned media, obviously. I, I'm from media, I'm from BBC Radio Merseyside, so I do the sports show for them. Um, yeah, it's interesting what you said there, and I don't know if any of you are interested in a career in media, and I'm sure it's something Dawn will look at as well later. You do put more pressure on yourself as a woman, and any mm. women I've spoken to in sport media especially, 
find they get criticised more because, as you say, go back in the kitchen, yeah. I've had it, oh, it's a waste of a ticket, you go into a game. That type of comment yeah. still do come in to you. Um, yeah. you know, I thought it was really good the way you know somebody offered you that advice. Yeah. Is it difficult, though? Do you feel you have to work maybe harder than some of your male colleagues in the media? To Do you, do you prep more? Oh, if you see my prep, I've literally <laughs> got prep like this, and you don't use half of it, yes, but I like do. Me today. Yeah. <laughs> it's just to make sure whether it's that comfort blanket, whether it is that the extra prep, because I feel when I do women's football, that's fine. You know, I very rarely get criticised, but as soon as you do, you know, the, the first time I did Soccer Saturday, I remember the, you know, the comments coming in, like, why is there a woman talking about men's football? You know, you've never played the game. I've played the, I've not played Premier League, but I've played the game and, and the game's very similar. And, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I quite like having male pundits on the women's game. And I think it just gives a different perspective. So, yeah, of course, you, you, you do prepare. But I think there's a lot of, of guys now know that they have to because I think the standard's going up. So I think you can't just rock up anymore and, and you know, just sort of go, well, I know football, I used to play. It is about making sure that you are fully prepared. So, yeah, as, as a female, I think I certainly do. Yeah, I, I do as well. Yeah. And anyone I seem to speak to, we all feel that... If you make one tiny mistake, oh, that yeah. will be focused on, whereas the men get away with making loads of mistakes. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> uh, and finally, I was just to say about male allies as well. It's important men, yes. I'm sure everyone agrees, it's important, you know, men stand beside women in sport and sport yeah. media as well, isn't it? I think that's so important. And, you know, the again, the men that I work with, you know, on Soccer Saturday, um, Stephen Warnock on the, the Monday show, they're absolutely brilliant. And, you know, if ever I get any sort of like negative comments, they're the first ones there and they're the ones to either comment back or they'll come and speak to me. Paul Merson phoned me up once when I got quite the, the Billy Sharp incident and spoke to me and, and sort of said, don't worry about it. Like, you know, we don't think it was just one mistake. I make mistakes every week. We all have a brain fart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it is. And, and that's the thing. It is just a mistake. And but you, you really sort of like you, you get yourself all wound up about it so it's nice to have those those male allies like you say within the industry before we move on we're going to put your work hat on oh no did anyone watch the merseyside derby and i, I presume we've got reds and blues yeah <laughs> okay was it a penalty 100 <laughs> it was a penalty as you can tell i'm a blue but yeah 100 percent is a penalty absolutely and if you need a recommendation <laughs> i can tell you something to watch on amazon prime no woman no try <laughs> oh, which is right. about uh, women's, <laughs> women's rugby, which brings me nicely. Uh, in fact, let's have a round of applause, though, first. Oh, for thank you. Amazing. Yeah, uh, no woman, no try if you haven't seen it and you've got Amazon Prime, it's a must watch. It's about women's rugby and somebody who features in it quite heavily is our next guest, uh, Zainab Alima. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to give you your intro because you're a player for Richmond Rugby. I'm going to take a deep breath because there's a lot here. He's a winner <laughs> of the Times Grassroots Sports Women of the Year in 2020, founder of the charity Studs in the Mud, a qualified nurse. Your nickname is The Bulldozer and you're also a mum of three under five. Mm. How you even got out the house today, <laughs> I do not know. Um, but yeah, if you want to tell us a bit about your career yeah, sure. in rugby and sports. Um, firstly, it's an honour to be here, knowing the history of Edge Hill University, like sitting here, especially amongst such amazing panellists, is an honour. And actually, I was so excited, I forgot to turn off my phone, so I don't want to get embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, that may be one of the kids. Me, so. <laughs> There's a problem, just turn I it off. I will um, <laughs> put my phone in silent. Okay, there. <laughs> Um, oh, where do I start? Okay, so I am a neonatal nurse by profession and a rugby player by passion. And I'll speak to you um, a little bit more about my nursing background and get to the sport because it does link in uh, further on down the line. Um, so I was born prematurely. I was born at 26 weeks. Um, my dad literally used to say I could fit into the palm of his, of his hand, literally from head to toe. I was that small. Um, and I guess the survival rate at that age um, or that gestation is pretty slim. So I guess I feel like I'm lucky to be alive and I guess I always had that fighter instinct in me. Um, so that sort of set the tone to my career. So I always knew from the get-go I wanted to become a nurse and specifically a neonatal nurse because I kind of had a burning desire that I had to give back to those that kept me alive essentially because the way my mum used to talk to me about the nurses and the doctors that looked after me, I kind of felt like it was a duty to work in the NHS. 
Um, so I've been a nurse now for um, about eight years now, but I recently put my nursing career in hold to focus on my rugby. It was probably the most scariest decision I've ever had to make, because if you can imagine, especially during the pandemic, everybody was clapping for us, and I'm like, bye. <laughs> so um, it was quite daunting. But, you know, sometimes life is too short. I think during the pandemic, there was a lot of things I was faced with that made me realise how precious life is. And if you want to do something, you want to go for something, you just have to do it and just, you know, just jump the gun and see what happens. Um, so to rugby now. Uh, so I started playing rugby at the age of 17. I actually first touched the ball at the age of 14. And it was my PE teacher um, who brought some rugby balls in. It was nothing to do with curriculum. We did netball, football, you name it, but rugby was not on it. But she was a rugby mad woman. And she brought some rugby balls and then she said, like, we're going to do rugby. And I was like, okay, miss, let's do it. Yeah, I was so excited. I was buzzing. I was the only one in my class that was buzzing for it. And just touching that ball and just running through people, I was like, oh, where has this sport been all my life? Like 14 <laughs> years without rugby. Um, but I never actually started my first club until the age of 17. I was in A-level in um, PE and I needed to do a physical component. So I, I remembered 14-year-old Z loved rugby. Actually, I want to do rugby uh, as the A-level. Um, and, you know, since then, I've never looked back since then. And I've got a massive... I know there's some teachers in here. I've got big respect for teachers. Like, I don't think anyone can sit in front of me and insult a teacher because I will not have it. I think they are... Um, they're under um, appreciated. I think you guys do so much and you deserve. Can we just give a round of applause to teachers, actually? Yeah. Um, and actually, if it wasn't for my PE teacher who went out the way to introduce me to rugby, I wouldn't be sitting here to eat. Like, I wouldn't be sitting here today because I would have known about rugby and my, my journey of my life probably wouldn't um, bring me to this point. So yeah, massive respect for teachers. Um, so yeah, I started rugby at the age of 14, first club at 17, which was Ealing Child Fighters in West London. I had no idea what I was doing. Like I just enjoyed running with the ball, but I, had no, I didn't know any of the rules or anything like that. Um, but what I did notice when I got into, so I played one year at uh, Ealing, then I went to university. So I went to University of Hertfordshire and that was an eye-opener to the rugby community because that's when I noticed that I was different. And when I say different, so I looked different. I was, I was the only black girl on my team. Um, I was the only Muslim girl on my team. Um, I was the only one that didn't drink alcohol. So there were so many aspects of my identity that made it... I didn't really know how to navigate my, myself around the rugby space. I had to learn that for myself. Like, what, what sports hijab do I wear to play rugby, for example? Um, how do I relate to my teammates off the pitch if I'm not having a pint with them? And also, if you're from, is there, have you got any rugby players in here? Yeah, I can't believe one, right? I know, I know, yeah, Jill's over here. Can we actually also, before I move on, um, Jill Burns, absolute inspiration. And I think it's such, it's such a small world to actually be here. I know you're. Uh, um, strong ties with um, at your university and I know just over the weekend you had your anniversary of your World Cup win um, absolutely amazing can we just give a legend yeah absolute legend of the game and you know because you've you've walked in the shoes before us it allows us to do what we're doing here so thank you so much um, and actually play county rugby so I'm familiar with the Jill Burns Cup which is amazing <laughs> um, oh, I've lost my train of thought now what was I talking about yeah, so I went to university and um, I realised that I, didn't, I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like I didn't belong because I didn't see anyone that looked like me of colour. I was the only Muslim girl. I didn't drink. So I had to really try and navigate my way within the rugby scene. But all I knew is that I loved the sport. I just knew I loved rugby. I loved running through people. And not just the, the physical element of it. The so oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, just the, um, Hence the bulldozer nickname. Yeah, actually, we'll get on to that. It's, it's, it's a really... Um, you might be disappointed. No. Yeah, but we'll get on to that. Um, so, you know, I didn't sort of know how to navigate myself within the rugby space. But I knew I loved the sport. And so I played three years in university. I remember one time during the, on, the, on the pitch, there was another black girl that came on the opposition. It was the first time I've seen a black girl on the pitch. And we, I was, um, we, were in so we were defending and we had to mark our players. 
And then everyone was like, oh, I've got the one with the yellow socks. I've got the one with the ponytail. And I was like, I've got the black girl. <laughs> and then everyone's, even the including the ref, everyone stopped and looked at me. I'm like, I'm a, first of all, I'm allowed to say that. And second of all, I'm just so like, this, what? Like, I'm not the only black girl on the pitch. This is awesome. I was so in awe that I just, it just came out. Anyway, we all had a laugh and we continued the game. Um, yeah, so I think rugby was a um, university rugby was quite tough for me, but it was literally the best rugby I've played ever. Met some, met some amazing, amazing teammates. And going back to the alcohol bit, so um, those that are familiar with sort of senior rugby, after the uh, match you get play of the match. And uh, not to toot my own horn, I still win that quite a bit, yeah, in uni. <laughs> and um, so you come to the bar after the game and you have to. Um, down a pint of, of alcohol. And obviously I didn't drink, so I, had to, I was put in an awkward situa situation where I, win, I kept on winning the awards, but I have to um, nominate someone else to drink my pint. And even that was like awkward, because I'm like, oh, what about if they don't want to drink? And it just, I just kind of felt like it was just an awkward position to be in. And actually, when I look back, I never actually said to my teammates, I'm Muslim, I don't drink, I don't. Because actually, during that time in university, I was still trying to find out who I was. Because you just come out from home, like, who am I? What do I believe in? What do I stand for? And then admitting to them that I'm different would make me feel even more um, left out. So, yeah, but actually, now I'm very confident in who I am. I know who I am. I'm Zainab Alima. I'm a black Muslim a woman. I'm a rugby player, and I'm the bulldozer. So let's go on to the... Let's yeah. go on to the so actually, there, then I was probably a bit more... Um, you know, I didn't know how to sort of sit and engage my teammates in that sort. No one ever said, let's go to have a picnic. Or let's go and, you know, it was all about clubbing and drinking. I'm like, oh, please just do something else. But now, you know, as, in, as an adult, we do find other ways to enjoy ourselves. Um, and actually, I remember my last, one of my last games for uni, they gave me a non-alcoholic pint to drink. And I'm like, oh, you get it. Like, you get it now. Like, you finally get it. And it was just like, I was part of the occasion, part of the celebrations, but I didn't have to compromise my faith, which was really important to me. Um, bulldozer, right. Yeah. Right. Tell us about the bulldozer nickname. So the bulldozer, um, obviously, I gave myself that nickname. I know it sounds cocky, but I need to, I need, <laughs> I need to explain. So what is the bulldozer? Let me put it out there. Anyone, you can shout, what is a bulldozer? Yeah, so a bulldozer is a construction equipment, right? You usually see it on building sites. What does it do? Smashes things, demolishes things. And for me, it's a metaphor for who I am and what I'm doing. So I'm a black Muslim woman within rugby, obviously being the male-dominated sport. I'm a mum of three kids. No one really expects a mum of three kids to be playing rugby. <laughs> no one expects like a, an NHS nurse whose back is always hurting to be playing rugby. You know, there's so many parts of my identity that no one really expects me to be playing rugby, but I am. So I'm smashing the stereotypes and I'm breaking down the barriers. So that's my interpretation of bulldozer. But I don't tell the opposition that because that seems a bit soft. Yeah. <laughs> so I just say bulldozer and, you know, they just sort of get the picture. Um, so I'll just move on to sort of me currently. So I, play, I currently play for Richmond Women. I moved over there. They're playing a the championship. Moved over there just last season. And my dream is to become the first black Muslim woman to play for England. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And, you know, that's part of the reason why I left nursing, because I just didn't think I would be able to manage, you know, this such a massive dream. And... You know, as I say, I'm a year into this journey and I'm loving it. It's not easy, but, you know, I'm going to stick out and see where it takes me. And for me, it's the journey that's more important than the end. And the reason why I'm doing it is all these things that I'm trying to do, trying to get more women and girls into rugby, trying to be more, you know, um, represent different cultures and mums and career women. I feel like me getting in that England shirt will make everything come together in my mind. And actually, it's not even really about rugby. It's not even really about... Um, me, it's not about me at all. It's, it's bigger than me. It's about giving people the um, empowerment to dream big and to follow their dreams. Because we all have dreams, right? It doesn't have to be a major. It could be just when you want to play, uh, you want to do a 5K. But that's still a goal you want to achieve. So I'm kind of using, I'm sort of taking one for the team and, you know, having this big goal. And if I can do it with all these different components and hats to me, then anyone can do it. And that's literally the message. So that's what I want to do. And uh, yeah, I think I always visualize myself standing and singing the national anthem. And I'm like, I think I'm not there yet, but I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so remember this face and you see me one day on the TV and say, yeah, I met her. 
I tell you the best thing. Um, I think I think you'll do it. I think you'll do it. And I think we'll all be crying when you're there. So <laughs> we'll all be crying when you. And you know, you talk about you know your Muslim faith as well. And and we, when you think of rugby, you think of drinking culture and mm. you know every like you mentioned going out clubbing afterwards. It's all part of the event, isn't it? How did you overcome that in the end? I mean, you said you didn't really like to speak to your teammates about your faith. Yeah. Did you feel you had to hide it almost? Yeah, I kind of felt, it sounds weird, but I kind of felt like I was leading two, two different lives. It's how it felt because I didn't, I never knew any other Muslim or practicing Muslim playing rugby. So I was like, who do I talk to, you know? And, um, but I think it came, what flipped the switch or what changed the game was me being okay with who I am. That was, that was it. And the moment I said, this is who I am, this is what I believe in, and this is what the world is going to see. And um, so it didn't matter what I was faced with. I just was strong in my identity. That helped me to, to be confident and to tell people, no, I don't want a pint. I want Earl Grey, please. Yeah. <laughs> which, is my, which is my favourite, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think, I mean, maybe you agree as well. I think quite often I've been in, in sport for 20 years in the media side, and you feel like you have to fit in with the men to start with, the bit of the, you know, the bawdy talk going on. And so you feel like you can't say anything. And I don't know if it's with age or with the fact that discussions like this are happening, that we are starting to change that. And you can still be a woman. You can still, you know, say, actually, I don't agree with that or I don't want to be involved in it, but still be part of sport. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the key. Like, you should have to see what works for you, really. But I don't think um, you should be excluded just because of certain things. I think just find how you can still be involved in an, a, a sporting environment, but still keep your boundaries. I think that's important as well. Absolutely. I know we've got a lot of questions for you coming up as well. Oh I'm God, just going to okay. move on uh, <laughs> very quickly, because obviously Simone has to go, but let's just hear it for Zayn Abalila. <laughs> Simone, we'll come to you now, because, uh, yeah, basically, I don't want to get told off by Everton, that's why. Um, <laughs> You've got a busy weekend because you've got your final home game of the season. And we'll just talk about Simone then. Simone's a forward for Everton, playing in the Women's Super League right now. Uh, also more than 50 appearances for Northern Ireland. You hold the world record as well, don't you, for the fastest international women's goal. Yeah. 11 seconds. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> I think I'd still be getting my kit on at that point. Um, and you're going to the Euros as well this summer. So you've got a massive summer. It's going to be huge for women's football this summer as well. And you're also studying here. You're doing a PhD right now at Edge Hill University. Yeah, well, I've paused it for the year. But, um, <laughs> Not unsurprisingly, with all that on the go. <laughs> but yeah, like I'm enrolled. So um, yep. I've been studying at Edge Hill for quite some time. So uh, yeah, on doing the PhD. So. Fingers crossed, I'll see it through. I'm sure you will. Right, well, if you want to tell us about your story in football and how you got into sport. Yeah, no problem. Well, good afternoon. It's lovely to be back here at Edge Hill. It's uh, been a while. Um, but yeah, no, I'll just talk to you a little bit about my journey. Um, so I'm from Northern Ireland, if you can't tell by my accent. Um, so yeah, when I was four years of age, I started playing football. I had an older brother, Chris, and um, he played every week, and I guess fear of missing out, I wanted to see what all the fuss was about, so um, I went along to play with him, and that was it. I fell in love with the game at a really young age, and I suppose some similarities to Sue's story. Um, there wasn't many opportunities for young girls when I was growing up playing, um, so all my early experiences were playing with boys, um, and that seen me through primary school. Um, I played with the boys teams there, and I got scouted for a boys team to play 11 aside when I was 10 years of age. And for a girl to be exposed to 11 aside football in your early years was so important because any girls teams that there was, it was seven aside and nine aside. So um, I vaguely remember turning up to the trials for the boys teams and there must have been about 100 boys there and I was the only girl. And literally, I walked through the, the gates, and they all turned around, and they were all whispering, like, oh, my God, there's a girl here. Why is there a girl here? <laughs> and I suppose that's something I suppose any female footballer has probably experienced in their time. And I suppose when I look back now, it was like, wow, how did I kind of overcome that? But when you're that age, you have no fear. You're like, give me the ball, and I'll show you what I can do. And <laughs> I suppose that's kind of what I tried to, to do. And um, it was a case of that. I, I signed for that team and I stayed with that team from when I was 10 to 15. And week 
in, week out. I played on the wing, and whoever the left winger was of the boys' team always got all the stick from the boys. Oh, you're up against the girl. And, you know, they would laugh and snigger, and that was something I had to overcome. And I, as soon as I got the ball, I would skin them, and then they would, you know, that would kind of <laughs> sh shut them up. And uh, I suppose um, those experiences at such a young age were so important, you know, in terms of building mental toughness. Um, you know, I was 11, 12 years of age, and I was having to face this week in, week out. And I think that that's what gave me the edge and the drive at such a young age to say, well, if I can do this, I can do anything. And, you know, I had always, from a young age, said I wanted to be a footballer. And when we used to get asked a question in school, what do you want to be when you're older, I used to say that. And my teachers always looked at me like, so come on. You know, it's not even a possibility, you know. Being a full-time professional footballer wasn't even an option, um, but it was a dream that I believed in and one that I was going to work hard to make sure I did everything in my power to, to get there. And so I then, moving on from that, I then joined a girls' team as well. And what I ended up doing was in the winter, I played with the boys, and in the summer, I played with the girls. And that's just what I had to do. If I wanted to you know, work hard and, and make this dream reality, that's what I had to do. And, uh, when I was 15, I had to stop playing with the boys, obviously, because I was too old. And I stayed with the girls' team at Ulster Ladies back in Northern Ireland. And I stayed with them right through until I was 18. And during this time, I was also on the international setup. I had gone through all the age groups, and I made my senior debut when I was 15. Um, obviously, we're a small country, and we don't have a big pool of players, but to get your international debut at 15 was... It was such an honour for me. It was always my dream to play for Northern Ireland and to do it at such a young age was incredible. So um, I had, a, I suppose, a different experience in high school when people were doing their GCSEs. I was jetting off around Europe, you know, and doing my homework on planes and in hotel lobbies. But, you know, I got used to balancing, I suppose, uh, study and uh, playing football to a high level. And that's something I carried right through my time. Obviously, I, I then made the move across when I was 18. And joined Edge Hill University and um, for me when I was trying to figure out what my next move is going to be there there were no pathways in place for for the girls if you wanted to try and become a professional footballer because there was no option it was only semi-professional in England and I suppose no one from Northern Ireland had ever done this before like no one had ever come across the water and tried to become a footballer it just had never been done and I suppose I was trying to make my own route trying to figure out how do I do this so I applied for university here at Edge Hill and I kind of picked Everton as the team I wanted to try and approach because they were renowned for giving young players a chance. Um, and being a young player, I wanted to go somewhere where I could play. So I reached out and uh, I got a trial and they signed me. So I was 18 and I was still doing my A-levels actually in high school and I used to fly back and forth every week from Northern Ireland to Liverpool to, just to play for Everton on a weekend, um, which was so cool when I was turning back up to school <laughs> on a Monday. Um, but yeah, when I finished my A-levels, then I made the move over officially and that was it. I had a one-way ticket and I was trying to make this dream a reality and no one had ever done it before and I was kind of winging it, to be honest. But um, yeah, so I signed for Everton and I was doing my studies here at Edge Hill. But I suppose that's where it's different for females than men because they have these clear pathways in place. They have academies that they can join. And for, for us, we had nothing like that. And we always had to think about, well, you know, what if this doesn't happen? I need something else to fall back on. Or even if I do make it, you know, we don't make the money the men make, so I'm not set. I have to think of another option. So education was my, my route, um, and it gave me a foundation to, I suppose, base myself here in England. You know, I couldn't just move over and play football because it wasn't professional. So I kind of chose, well, if I go with the education route, it, it gets me over here, and then I can build my football that way. And that's exactly what I did. And Lucky for me, you know, I did my three years undergrad here and then I did a master's. And when I finished my master's, we actually went full time, full professional. So I signed my first professional contract and I was the first player from Northern Ireland to do it, which was, you know, I think it was just such a monumental moment for the country, I suppose, when I'm trying to fly this flag and show all the young girls that, look, I've come out of this tiny town in Northern Ireland and I've done it, so you can do it. And I suppose, when I look back now, obviously, even when I signed that contract, where the game was then and where it is now, it has grown significantly, you know. And when I look, if I was a young kid now, the opportunities young girls have, it's, it's incredible. And I think it's testament to where the game has, has gone. You know, I've got to play in some mega stadiums. And 
the games are on TV week in, week out, you know. My niece, I think about her, she's just starting her football journey and she can turn the TV on and she can watch me play. When, when I was a kid, there was one game I could watch on TV that was women each year and it was the FA Cup final on BBC that Sue spoke about. And that was it. You know, my role models were all male footballers. I didn't have any female ones. And it's not because they weren't there, it's just I couldn't see them because they're not on TV and the resources just weren't there. So to see where the game is now and the fact that when I think of my niece who can just turn the TV on and everything is there and it's, it's come such a long way. You know, we played England two weeks ago in Windsor Park and we sold out the stadium. And it was just, I never in my lifetime thought that, you know, our country would do that. And I think, you know, we, we've qualified for the Euros this summer, which is going to be insane. Um, but just to see the impact that that's had already, you know, just to see the interest, the girls that want to play, you know, we're selling out stadiums. It's just incredible to see that, you know, the game has, has come this far. And to kind of been a part of that is just such a nice feeling, you know, to know that we're paving the way for young, young kids to come through. And there are pathways and structures in place for them now if they want to dream about becoming a professional footballer, they can be because it's a reality now. And for me, that just wasn't a reality and I had to make my own route. And albeit that route will be different now because there are academies for girls and there are these structures in place. And it's just fantastic that the opportunities are now there for them. And, um, you know, we've come such a long way and we've still got such a long way to go. You know, we're filling stadiums out, but not on a regular basis. So I think that's where we want to get the game. You know, we want to get people through the doors week in, week out. You know, it's on TV, but let's sell the stadiums out. Like, let's get, you know, people through and, and, and let's build it that way. And uh, I think we will get there. You know, it is getting there. And I think the summer will, will boost that again. Yeah, this summer's going to be hugely exciting for women's football. And something you say there, Simone, is what Zainab was saying, what Sue was saying. It's almost like, as a woman in sport, you've got to have a double identity or a triple identity almost, because you, you, you've got all these different hats on and you, you know, you've got to be different people. So you're a student, you know, you're a mum as well. You know, you're, you're focusing on your media at the same time as playing, which you don't see men always having to do, you know, all these different roles. Is that how you feel sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, I always made sure that I had something else to fall back on because I had to. You know, the men in, in the game don't need to think about that because, you know, they get paid. A lot, a lot. <laughs> more money than I can think of. You know, so you know if you know they got an injury or or whatever, you know they're okay. Whereas for us, it's a lot different. So we have to have other options and you know keep as many doors open as possible because you know that's just what we have to do. Before we get to Dawn, I know you've got to go, so you're going to miss the Q and A. But somebody really wants to ask a question, so I'm going to sneak that in just before yeah, you go, if that's okay. Vicky Fosker, who is Edge Hill alumni and is here somewhere, I think we've got a microphone that we can get to you, has got a question. Um, there we go. <laughs> just give us a wave. We can't really can't really see. <laughs> Hi, uh, you just mentioned about the financial side of it, and I just wondered, can you see any kind of equality coming into that side of it at all, in terms of the, f the female side of it, earning similar to the male? Um, I think if we look at the game overall, it has come such a long way in terms of what we get now as females. You know, when I first started playing, I know Sue said, we used to pay to actually play, and you know, we didn't get a lot of support and things like that, and we're starting to get that now. You know, the investment has been put in, and the game has grown. It's come such a long way, and I still think that it's got a long way to go. Um, I think if we look at the US women's national team, they were kind of very vocal on fighting for equal pay, and I think that they had the right to, because I think ultimately they, they bring in the commercial revenue. So you know, it's realistic for them to say, well, we want equal pay. And I think that that's something, yeah, we will fight for eventually when the time's right. I think we've got to get things right from the bottom first. And once we do, and once we start getting people, you know, like I said, through the gates week in, week out, and we're starting to actually see profitable revenue come, come in, then I think then we're in a more realistic position to, to start to ask for things like that. Fantastic. Thank you for asking a question. And uh, yeah, we better let you go so we don't get a phone call saying yeah. you're late for training. You've got a That's game a against Tottenham <laughs> on Sunday. So thank you very much to Simone McGill. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I do. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, the last thing we want is a phone call saying, where is she? We've got a game on Sunday. Um, OK, well, our final guest you're going to hear from um, is somebody that I've been dying to hear all about her career. Uh, Dawn Airy is a media executive, I'm sure you know, is the chair of the Barclays FA Women's Super League and the Women's Championship. You're on the board at Channel 4 as well. You have a massive list of commitments that you... I'm not even going to list them all. Uh, you've worked across ITV, Channel 5, Sky. Uh, you're also an Edge Hill honoree as well, recognition of her career as an internationally acclaimed executive and media and broadcast industries, according to the website. Yeah, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah. So please welcome Dawn Airy. Thank, th thank you very much. Um, I'm very conscious of time. There's so much that I could talk about, so I'm going to try and pricey, pricey things down. But you've been sitting very patiently listening to actually three, I thought, staggeringly brilliant stories, uh, three women who've, got, who've achieved so much and are going to do so much more. Um, but you have been sitting down for sort of 45 minutes, so I'm going to engage with you just for a moment, if I may. How many of you um, are involved in sport um, as a profession? Teachers, players, just hands up so I get a sense. So that's quite, quite a lot, thank you. How many, and I'm looking at the block in the middle because I reckon most of you are students here, how many of you um, want a career in sport? Don't be hesitant, it's sort of, is that a maybe or no? That's quite, quite a lot, okay. How many of you want a career in media? Fancy a career in media? Oh, not too many. Right, then that helps me guide in terms of what I'm going to talk to you about. So, um, I started out in television in the 80s, and in the 80s, the world was a very different place to, to, to where it is now. Um, and I wanted to be a producer. Uh, but as often in life, you, you get setbacks very early on. And I applied to the BBC. I was so confident I was going to get into the BBC. And you know what? The buggers wouldn't have me. <laughs> and I couldn't understand why, because I'd done all the right things at, um, uh, at university. I went to Cambridge. I studied geography. Well, actually, that let me get into university. I didn't study very much. I just had a great time. Um, <laughs> but I knew I wanted to tell stories. Um, and, uh, and the place to do it was the BBC, and they didn't take me. So I applied to regional companies, ITV, uh, Central Television was the first company to say, yes, fine, we'll take you. I went. I never actually became a producer of news and current affairs, which is what I wanted. And, and the point of this little story is that in life you can say, I want to achieve something, and sometimes you don't get there. Uh, and it's fine, because life takes you on all sorts of journeys. And people say to me when they look at my career, started out as a trainee, I've, I've been chief executive and creative broadcasters, I've run international uh, media businesses, or you must have had a career plan. Well, the truth is, my career plan was to get into the BBC. That went by wayside for, when I was first out the gate. And so you sort of take opportunities that, that, that come along. And I knew I wanted, like I said, to be in telly. That was my passion. My passion was to facilitate creativity but also to make, mon to make money in the process. Um, and I learned very quickly that the way to get on um, is to work incredibly hard. The one thing that, it, that, that you will never get anywhere unless you work not only hard, but pretty much harder than anybody else. And be incredibly nice. I, always, I say to my, my girls, please and thank you gets you a hell of a long way. Being polite, being engaged, um, will take you will take will, will take you far being a decent person being a nice person being a person who's curious uh, and interested so I started out as a, as a trainee at Central and um, I I worked on a lot of shows Price is Right Blockbuster $64,000 question these are shows you've probably never heard of Crossroads <laughs> the most terrible soap sorry um, um, uh, but I did, did lots of things tried to make myself indispensable and was always curious was always asking questions well why is that show on at this time of the day why, why are we doing this um, and I very quickly moved out of sort of the creative side into making decisions about programming and I suddenly discovered but actually, I was quite good at that, because I'm always curious about motivation. Um, and um, I moved on through television very, very fast. Now, it helped in the late 80s and early 90s being a female. Uh, being a female who was also quite robust. And it was interesting hearing about the nicknames that you're, you're given. You, uh, you gave yourself. Uh, so the, uh, sorry, you were given. You gave yourself as a bulldozer. I was known as Scary Airy and Zulu Door. Now, where the hell did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. Back to the point that Sue said. 
I made sure I did my research. I made sure that when I used to go to network committees, and I was only invariably only, well, not invariably, I always was the only female, but I had done my research. So when it came to negotiating what shows got on air in those days in ITV, I could slag off all the, every other uh, show and then say, this is why my shows for my company should be uh, getting this slot and should be, should be broadcast. I did my homework. Back to the hard work paid off. And then I got these caricatures, which are, which are nice, but it's sort of slightly irritating 40 years later. It's all scary area. Go, you know, a lot more so sophisticated than that. Um, but you had to, but I had to learn resilience um, because I was subject to, as you, got, as you have both been, um, to um, uh, a lot of negative comment just by virtue of the fact that I was a female. We had to, I, we, there's no two ways about it. One had to be better than the men to get on. Uh, and... Uh, and I, and, I, and I was. But you had to develop a pretty thick skin. And some of the things that one was called and how you were treated was, you, you would probably go to jail for that today. But that was the culture of the time. And, and the good thing is, I look at all of you, and I hope you never have to experience um, some of the sexist comments that certainly I, I um, was faced, but also the challenges uh, that, that I was given. And I look at my kids, and I've got two girls, 15 and 11. And they will never have to, never have to put up with what I had to put up with. And that is a really, really good thing. Anyway, I worked for every broadcaster you can imagine. Started out at ITV, then went to um, a Channel 4 where I commissioned arts and entertainment, which was basically all the fun and the rude bits that got the channel into trouble. I then went, um, <laughs> I then went from there to, to, uh, to Channel 5, and I was the first creative director of Channel 5. And we, against all odds... Um, uh, retuned half the nation's uh, video recorders at the time. And it's sort of ridiculous to think when Channel 5 came along, it was the, it was the last free-to-air channel, and then there was only four channels. And think about the 400, 500 channels. You probably don't even watch channels. You just get your stuff from YouTube, as my kids did. Um, uh, and we created a channel that went from 0 to 6.5% share, which was huge. We took the company from nothing, and we were much derided to a billion-dollar business in the space of uh, four years. It was an unbelievable financial success. We, were, we positioned ourselves as a modern mainstream channel. I came up with a very flippant phrase. Forgive me. I'm going to use a very... Well, I won't use a very rude word. You can fill it in. I was asked by a, uh, by a, a, journalist, a journalist, so tell me about Channel 5. What's it about? I said, well, some would say it's about films, the F word, and football. But it's about a lot more than that. And it was, just, and there was headlines of the Guardian. Head of, head of Channel 5 describes it as the three Fs. Um, and I've never, ever, ever been able to quite get, get move on, move on, move, move, move on from that. But Channel 5 was a challenger. That's another thing that I've always looked for. I'm looking for challenge, looking for companies that, that are, that, that are challenging the status quo or need change. And those, those are just two things, two things that, I, that I've looked for in my career and have served me well. Um, so I went from five, then I went um, to Sky, um, and I was started off running all of the wholly owned, wholly owned channels of Sky, so everything from Sky One to Sky News, to then getting all of, the, all of the channels that were carried on Sky, including third party and the advertising sales. One thing I didn't have control of was sport. Now, you do know the world will have changed when Sky has a head of sport that's, that's a woman. So I am hoping that that is going to happen um, uh, in my lifetime. So I had, a, I had a ball at Sky. Sky was then, again, it wasn't the big, massive success story that it is today. It was on, on that journey. It was a challenger brand. That's why I went there. And then from um, Sky... I joined a company that had to go into administration. People would say, oh, you're supposed to be really smart. You joined a company, uh, and then it had to be put into administration. I was the chief executive. Again, adversity. Again, um, wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't a bad thing for me and my, uh, for me and my career because I learned a lot about wrongful trading, uh, but also um, from if you, if, you, if you don't take risks, um, you won't improve. Honestly, risks are a good thing, and failure is a good thing. I look at my television career, and I was considered to have a very successful television career. I made so many decisions that were wrong, but I made lots of decisions. And overall, more than 50% were right, so that was good enough. That was, that was massive success. Anyway, then I did that, and I worked, uh, worked in Yahoo, in West Coast, because I wanted to know how, how West Coast companies looked at engagement and know down, down to the second what folks are doing. Um, 
and then ran laterally Getty Images, big global photography agency, a global uh, agency uh, out of New York. Came back to the UK, I worked for private equity, job done, very happy, gonna come back, wasn't sure what I was gonna do, um, uh, and then started to go plural. What's plural? That means you're so old um, uh, that you just do lots of things. And actually, um, <laughs> That is what I ended up doing, not because I'm so old, uh, but, but because I've always had a curiosity. And so now I chair two theatre companies, the National Youth Theatre and a digital, digital theatre company. Um, up until two weeks ago, uh, I was uh, chairing uh, Channel 4, and I chair uh, the Women's Super League and the Women's Champions League. So I've got, now got to football, and I'm going to be really, really quick. So how and why did I end up chairing um, the, the Women's Super League and Women's Championship? I was approached by a headhunter and said, look, Women's football is beginning to create a momentum. The FA wants to set up a separate board because it believes it needs its own governance. They want somebody who's got knowledge and interest in sport, um, but they don't want somebody who's sort of steeped in sport. And anyway, I went through a series of interviews, and I've always been interested in football. So where did that come from? Well, it came from multiple, multiple inputs, as I'm sure your interest in sport cut as a result of multiple things. So like um, um, a, a fellow panelist, family. So my father was a failed footballer, trial for Preston North End, but he always played football, and football was a passion for him. My other half's um, cousin, a professional footballer, played for um, Queen of the South. Uh, my wife is obsessive about football. I mean, like, obsessive. Uh, watches, like you, football all day, every day. Nothing that Jackie doesn't know, uh, doesn't know about football. And then I've got history in football, real history in football. So my cousin's grandma. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is an important story, really important story. And we knew about this when I was growing up. My Val, my cousin, um, grandma. So uh, not our joint grandma, but on her father's, on her father's side. Um, his, his mother was a lady called Alice Kell. Does Alice Kell mean anything to anybody? Just going to test your sporting. No, you grin. You should, I'm, you're going to know about Alice Kell, because Alice Kell was a game changer. Alice Kell was captain of the Dick Kerr's ladies team. Dick Kerr was a women's team created in the 20s when the men were at war, and they were incredibly popular. So they, Dick Kerr was a munitions factory, uh, and they played in Preston, so just up the road, down the road. Um, and she, uh, she, they were unbelievably successful, unbelievably successful. And they played against um, uh, other women's teams, and it was unbelievably popular. They were selling out. There were 60,000 audiences. In fact, it took 98 years for the attendance to be broken globally for women's football. Uh, and they played football, and the money they raised went to, uh, went to the war effort. So it was an, ama an, amazing, an amazing story. So amazing and so successful was women's football. In 1921, the FA banned it. Banned women playing football. Um, uh, to crown, uh, to in, in professional stadiums. And why did they do that? They did it because women's football was proving to be immensely popular, and they were rather good. And I think the men's game felt slightly threatened by it. So they stopped it for 50 years. Bloody shocking. Anyway, we're catching up with them now. So the women, Women's Super League and women's, women's Championship has a very, very simple, it has very simple aims and goals, which is we want to inspire positive change. We want every little girl... Um, and every, and every uh, young girl and woman who wants to play football to be given the access and opportunity to, to play football. Uh, and there is, and you, you've heard about, you heard, heard about it earlier from Simone, about there is now uh, a whole infrastructure that allows little girls to play at school. They're not enough can play at school, and there is a big issue. There, isn't, there aren't enough football stadiums. There, you know, foot, for, uh, PE is not taken as seriously as one would like it to be taken on the curriculum. Um, to give little girls the opportunity to have a career playing football or behind, or behind the, uh, not on, on the pitch, but um, off the pitch, having fantastic careers in football. And the FA is, want, is playing a key, key part in every stage of that. But the pinnacle of it at the moment is the professional game, which is the Super League. Fully professional Super League. One of only two professional leagues um, uh, in Europe that's, that's, that's fully professional. And the championship that is sort of semi-pro. But let's be clear, there is a gulf between men's football and women's football in terms of both investment um, and infrastructure. But the reason um, that 
the, the, that I, one, of the, one of the other key reasons I took on this role is I have an 11-year-old who's also uh, mad about football, uh, and she's, um, she plays for the young girls. She's on the development team for, uh, for girls for, for Brentford, and she wants to be a professional footballer. And my view is if, and we've heard it again on this panel, if you can't see it, you can't be it. We want women's football to be visible. It is visible. There was a turning point, I think, in 2019. Forget the, the turning point in 1920 with Alice Kell, but there was a turning point in 2019 when 11.7 million people tuned in to watch the, to watch, um, the England team play the USA in the World Cup semi-final. And suddenly there was, I think, that summer an appreciation that actually women's football is bloody good. It's great entertainment. These are extraordinary, extraordinary athletes. And actually we want more of it. So going to the, one of the, another reason for the, being involved in, in the FA and, Super, and the Super League and the Championship League was I wanted to, football, I wanted to, to get to greater audiences, as indeed did the FA. And that's what we've done. So the deal that we did, we, there were two deals that were done. One was with Sky, one was with, with the BBC. And Sky BBC have been extraordinary partners. We've got regular slots. You can watch women's football. You know, pretty much whenever you want. You can watch every match in Super League and pretty much the championship also on, 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 the, on the FA player. Football is there and it's present. And you can see young women who are strong, who are unbelievably uh, accomplished uh, and athletic, athletic entertaining you. And they're paid. They're not paid anywhere, like I said, near what the men, men's game is. But we're, that, is, that is part and parcel of the journey that we're on. So we've got one really good deal. We're in a 18 months' time. We'll be having another deal that we need to strike with the broadcasters in the UK. It's seen globally. We sell, we sell the rights uh, internationally, but we're on a journey. And do I, uh, what, what I'd love to see, and I, it's you, 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 you in this audience, especially the young girls that I'm looking at now, you know, you are the ones who are, going to who are going to determine the success of football. You're going to watch it on whatever device you watch. You're going to go, hopefully, and support uh, local clubs. You're going to ask the commercial sponsors and people you're involved with, well, why aren't you sponsoring fo women's football? And, this m and you're going to see what you're seeing now, which is a momentum of women's football being huge. It is the single largest growing property in the world, um, women's, um, uh, women's sport. Uh, in the UK at the moment, if you look at all sports, it's worth about 350 million. Uh, the predictions are that will be a billion um, by the end of the decade. It has the potential to be huge. It should have parity with the men's game. Why on earth shouldn't it in terms of uh, investment in opportunity, in terms of what you've been paid um, uh, in your career? Why should there be any difference um, if it's getting the engagement that it's beginning to get? So... Uh, that's a little bit of my story. Uh, so I've spoken too long. I'm going to shut up so you can ask questions. Um, I could talk for hours. Um, but women's sport and women's football uh, in particular, it's uh, the opportunities are immense. And they're immense for your careers, uh, as well as immense in terms of the social responsibility of getting it right. So thank you. I said it would be fascinating, and it absolutely was, so thank you. And I think what you know, you're talking not just about visibility for women in sports, as everyone else has, but also about being curious. And I think that is brilliant advice. Keep being curious, keep asking why, keep showing up, keep you know, pushing, knocking on those doors. Um, I know we've got quite a few questions. I'm going to get through as many as I can before Sarah tells me off. <laughs> we'll keep going as long as I possibly can. Um, I think it's broken into schools on here. Should we start with one from Penwortham Primary Academy? I've got some names here. Some of the schools I haven't got names. Um, I'm just going to pick one here. Who should we go for? Uh, Phoebe Bolton has got one for Sue Smith. Is Phoebe here? Is that yours? Everyone's looking mortified now. This is where everyone goes, oh, that was me. I didn't think I'd be pointed out. <laughs> Phoebe, I hope it's not a maths question. <laughs> yeah. It's to explain the penalty decision. Yeah. Explain VAR. <laughs> My question was, how do you deal with high-pressure situations? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think throughout my, my football career, there's, there's obviously been a lot of, of 
you know, high pressure situations in terms of big games or, you know, I used to take penalties. So that was sort of quite a, a high pressure situation playing for England, you know, something that I've always wanted to do. So I remember first walking out thinking, well, this is, you know, this is pressure even now, you know, in, in the sort of media. So I think it's a case of, we actually spoke about this before, feeling nervous is okay. Because um, I actually said before doing this, I felt a little bit nervous because it's out of, of my comfort zone. But that's OK. It's how you sort of control those nerves. And, and I think that's something that I've been quite good at doing. So I, I know that I'm feeling nervous, but that's more that I'm prepared. And I think that's the other thing to make sure that you're fully prepared in everything you do. So for my games, I'd know that I'd trained so hard through that week. I'd know that I'd ate the right foods, you know, drunk the right drinks. I'd done everything I possibly could to make sure that I was in the best possible position to, to play the best game that I could. And even now with the media, um, you know, so for those shows, like we spoke about earlier, I make sure that I'm prepared for everything, you know, how things can change in the media. They're not going to catch me out now because I'm completely prepared in everything. So I think that's probably, for me, the best way that I've dealt with those pressure situations. And yeah, not about not being afraid to be nervous, I suppose. That's the thing. Because I think sometimes we go, oh my goodness, we're really nervous. This is going to be a real nightmare. But actually just, OK, I'm nervous, but that means I'm ready. I'm ready for, for what's coming. Great question. Brilliant, thank you. Um, at Mel's Cop High School, I've got some questions here, but I haven't got the names, but I thought one of them would be quite good for Zainab to answer. So I don't know if this person here is who asked about, um, I mean, do you want me to ask the question? Shall I ask the question for you? I just, what do you do when people tell you you're not going to make it? Oh, wow. Run into um, them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bulldoze them. Do you know what? No one's really said that to me. I think it's me that's probably said it to myself initially. Um, but everyone's been... I mean, you said that it's going to happen already. So it, it is. <laughs> so um, I think if I was to get that comment, um, it was just me... I think what I'll do is just... Well, not listen. I want to be, yeah, not listen, not take it on board, um, believe in myself, know what, know what I can do. And just like Sue said about preparation and making sure you're ready, I think that's sort of the main thing. So, yeah, I would just say, whatever, I'll show you that I will do it. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, King's Leadership Bolton are here. Again, I've got questions. I don't know if someone wants to put their hand up, though, and just ask one of the panel. That might be. There we go. Brilliant. We've got a microphone coming down to you. Just hang on a second. We'll give you your moment. <laughs> How do you balance your religious lifestyle with your job, family, and sporting commitments? That's a brilliant question. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, I think for me, okay, so with me, I feel like my, my religion is a way of life. I don't think it's separate from um, everything else I do. And even with rugby, so this can sound crazy, but I feel like there's a correlation between rugby and Islam. And let me just finish, because I was like, well, how do you? <laughs> so for me, a lot of the rugby principles, you know, respect, discipline, sportsmanship, teamwork, they're sort of, it comes naturally for my religion. Like we are sort of meant to, you know, be like a community of people, uh, respect each other, respect nature, respect your elders, um, discipline. Even, for example, now I'm fasting, right? And obviously the food out there is so tempting. <laughs> but you have to be disciplined, and um, that's part of rugby as well, um, making sure you're onside in a rugby pitch. So there's so many similarities between my faith and my, um, my lifestyle and my rugby that I just feel like it was a sport for me. And you get to hit people and not get arrested. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah, it was like a no-brainer for me. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, the Deanery CE High School here. I don't know if we, oh, there we go, brilliant. I love it when hands go straight up as well, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get a microphone to you as well. What do you still think needs to be done to raise the profile of women in sport? Do you want anyone in particular? I think it's Dawn maybe for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah Dawn. Um, well, I think we're, I, it's a journey, but we're, my goodness gracious, you know, we're, we're on that journey. I mean, you know, Sue talked earlier. It's, it, women are commenting, you know, commentators and have careers on screen um, talking about men's sport, not exclusively women. You know, good thing. Um, all of the work that the you know, FA and indeed um, all of the sporting bodies, of which there are many in this country, are championing um, uh, women, women, women's sport and giving it, uh, um, and giving it funding. 
Um, and visibility is critical. Um, and it's not just visibility on broadcast, it's visibility on social media. Um, and it's interesting when I look at, for example, at um, some of the WSL clubs. I mean, uh, Chelsea's, I think, Instagram account has more, than, uh, more followers than most of the Premier League clubs. They work hard. The women, women's, women's um, sport works very, very hard on its social outreach. Again, that's all absolutely key in terms of, of, terms of raising the profile. But I think, you know, we are, we're, we're out of, you know, I'm going to use some crash analogies now, but we're out of the starting blocks. You know, women, it's your time. I say this is, this is 21st century, it's our century, girls, okay? You are going to crush and smash through, and you are every bloody glass ceiling that you hit, hit and more. You just do not accept, oh, well, it's just women or whatever. You constantly lobby and fight, and also you spend your money. You spend your discretionary money on brands that are, that are um, representing what you want to be represented. So I just think there's, there's, we're, we're on a journey, and it's doing this. And it's just a question of keeping that momentum. But visibility is key. Brilliant. Um, we'll go back to Penwith and Priory Academy again. I'm sorry, because I've got your names, so I feel like I'm singling people out here, which is awful, isn't it? And Fatima's got a really good question for Zainab um, about education and sports. Do you want to put your hand up? Oh, there we go. <laughs> so sorry to sing you out. We'll just get the microphone to you. I thought this was an interesting one for you. <laughs> Um, how did you balance education and sport? Um, oh, okay. So I think that takes me back to university because obviously I was starting to be, I was doing my nursing degree and obviously I was playing rugby. And it was, it was good. I think it balanced each other out. So going into placements and, you know, being in stressful situations at work, um, well, in placement whilst I was studying, being on the pitch and being able to release those stresses really went hand in hand. And actually, I kind of felt it was cool when we'll be in the classroom on Wednesdays, that was like sports days in university. It'd be like, oh, we have to go rugby now and we'll get our bags and leave we'll get to leave early. So I think it was, uh, it was a nice balance because the rugby helped me to release stresses of um, the, the work, the education and learning. So yeah, it was fine. Great question, thank you. We've got time for one more question because if I keep taking any more, I'll never be allowed back here ever again. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just open it up. If you want to just, the first person that shoves the hand up, there we go, <laughs> we'll get the microphone down to you. So obviously we've got football here and rugby. What do you think the next sport for women's going to be that's going to come up in the media? That's, that's like open question. to anyone. Yeah. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll think, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a rising tide. I mean, if you if you look at cricket, the hundred cricket was huge, absolutely huge. And if you look at, there was a, I think the women's women in sports trust published a paper, oh, actually about a month ago, um, about how many how many people had watched women's sport last year, and it was 33 million, and 12 million were new, and they were new, uh, and they were watching women's super league and the hundred. So so cricket. Cricket is, is on it is on its way. I think rugby is on its way. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, football is well on its way. Is is is, is well on its way. But it you know, should be all sport to be honest. Yeah. That anybody wants to want to watch, wants to watch and engage with. But but cricket cricket is up there. Fantastic. And uh, a couple of documentaries then, if you are wanting to get more on this. We mentioned it before. No woman, no try. Yeah, I'm Amazon so Prime. that you put that shameless plug I'll, in. I'll plug it for you. <laughs> it's not a problem. That's what I'm here for. That's on Amazon Prime. It's well worth a watch. It is an eye-opener. And there's also another one called LFG, if you've watched that. It's on Sky. It's with the US, I have to say soccer team. US women's football team, that's what it is. Uh, you know, and their fight for equal pay and equality. It is absolutely fascinating. So if you want to go home and watch any of those, I definitely recommend them. Um, I'm sure we could have spoken all afternoon. And uh, I just find it fascinating listening to women like we've had today about their own experiences and, and things like that. And thank you for your questions as well. I, I could talk about it all day long. Uh, I think we're going to hear now just very quickly from Pro Vice Chancellor Linda Brady as well, who wants to say a quick word to everyone who's come today. Um, my first one is to my colleagues who organised this fabulous event, uh, particular, particularly Sarah uh, and colleagues in the corporate communications team, how you managed to get this fabulous group of women here, I have no idea, but it's been absolutely amazing. 
thank you to all of you for being here, for being so engaged, for asking absolutely brilliant questions. I know that's a really scary bit, uh, much scarier than uh, giving the answers. Um, but of course, the main thank you, uh, in addition to Julia's excellent chairing of the event, um, has to go to this amazing panel. I now know why it was called Game Changers. I know why you were referenced as a trailblazers. Um, when you came in the room, actually, you felt an energy, which I think since, you know, for a long time we haven't felt, pre-COVID really, we haven't felt that sort of sense of energy of, you know, the fact that we can actually do things, the being together, the having the conversations. And uh, it, it's just been absolutely fantastic. And I think I've got, I want to adopt Dawn's um, three Fs. <laughs> <laughs> any of them out. So my three Fs, fabulous, needs absolutely no uh, explanation. Feisty was my second one. Um, and feisty because I think what's come across really, really strongly is being, you know, the need to be prepared to challenge, to say, no, that's not right, this is what we're going to do, and to try and really break down those barriers. Um, funny, because actually they have all been hilarious. And I think, you know, as Dawn says, being nice and, you know, actually being an engaged individual that can have a conversation and actually be witty and entertaining does get you quite a long way. Not that I need no one. But my main F, actually, my, 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 my sort of most important F, I think, um, is feeling. Um, and that is about, you know, the passion, the caring, the actually, you know, really, really wanting to make a difference, to be someone to actually break down the barriers. And I thought it was fantastic the way Zainab referenced Jill, who's here as well, you know, and, to, you know, we've stood on Jill's shoulders in terms of, of female rugby. Um, actually, you know, these are the, the women who have made a difference. And I think as, as all of them have said, really, there are many women in this audience who are going to be the future and make a difference. And I think sometimes you can, you know, you can think we haven't really made progress. And what's been fantastic, I think, today has been, you know, that reminder of how far we have come. You know, in probably, you know, 20 years, 40 years, however long you want to look at it. But actually, the speed of change seems so much faster now, and it does feel like actually a bigger difference can be made in a shorter period of time. So. You know, I think we're all going away feeling completely energised by what you've said, really motivated and really inspired by it. So, you know, huge, huge thanks. You're all very, very busy women. Um, so thank you for your time, your expertise, your caring and your contribution to, you know, not only this, but to Edge Hill and to this debate, not just today, but every day where you're making, you know, those changes and breaking down those barriers. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here and huge, huge thanks to the, to the panel.